Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Niles SNA Silent Film Museum's Salute to Cable Cars. Uh, cable cars are something that we know about to some degree. Um, I think our involvement with cable cars came because of our film historian David Keene's revelation about the trip down Market Street film that was filmed from a cable car in 1906. Although I've been corrected more than a few times by people saying there were no cable cars on Market Street. Well, yes, there were until the earthquake and then there became the, uh, the, mar the railway cars uh, and other trolleys and such um, or whatever they're called. Please don't correct me because I don't know. I'm getting that right up. Anyway, I want to introduce Jeffen Taylor and Heather Taylor who have made this most amazing documentary uh, a couple of years ago on cable cars. And uh, I think for me, the number one question that I, I had for you was um, how did this come to be? Because when you told me before why you made this film, I was kind of dumbstruck. So that is my first question to you both is how did you come to make this film? Okay, um, so I've done a, a few films, a few documentaries on San Francisco. We did one on Playland, we did one on Sutro Bass and uh, we've done a few others. And um, I, uh, really like the uh, the concept of one that the San Francisco Bay wasn't discovered by Western civilization for quite a long time. And uh, they would sail right by it all the time. And then when they finally discovered it, it's like, look at this, this is amazing. And um, the, the our waterways are so pretty uh, complicated uh, and we have a lot of lighthouses. And I wanted to do a documentary on the lighthouses and waterways of San Francisco, which I'm still eventually going to do if we ever get out of such things as a pandemic. Um, but uh, so I was like, okay, uh, I started reading up on it and doing history on it, um, uh, looking for history on it. And uh, it's, it's pretty complicated. And uh, um, I figured what I would do is I, I knew that the, from my previous experience with San Francisco history that the uh, cable car um, history is, is, is just as complicated. Uh, there's so many uh, uh, layers to it. It's like it was, it started very small and then grew and grew and grew. And it was very uh, complex. Like you said, Market Street had, I think there was every few seconds a cable car at its prime on Market, uh, Market Street. So the, the city was filled with cable cars at a, at a certain point before the earthquake. And um, so I said, oh, what I'll do is I'll look at a documentary. I'll see what another filmmaker did to explain like that as a slow, you know, a slow burn, because obviously coming through the mouth of San Francisco into the San Fr through the Golden Gate and into the San Francisco Bay would be the beginning of this cable car. And then as you, as the commerce grows, it'd be the same thing as the growing of the cable cars. Uh, uh, so I'd said, okay, I'll just watch a documentary on how they handled it to get an idea, you know, a, a starting point. And um, there was no documentaries. There's no, there's one small film, uh, I think it's called The Feel of the uh, um, Cable or something like that, that was made um, and that they had a lot of access to the, um, to, to the cable car museum, stuff like that, but it wasn't comprehensive at all. It had, it was very little history. It was more of a feel good thing. Um, there's a few 70s documentaries too that are, again, just pretty feel good, There's but no history and no, you know, what is this or, or even a mechanical explanation of it. And I was kind of dumbstruck. I was like, whoa, how could there be no, no, you know, history of, of a cable car documentary, which kind of bit me in the rear later on. And I'll, I'll explain that. But so I'm like, okay, you know what, let me put the, the lighthouses and, and waterways to this wayside for a minute. And let me work on this because it just was like to me, I, I just thought there would have been at least, you know, a half a dozen films on the cable car history. And um, so that's when we started working on the, the, um, the, the film. And um, uh, I got a hold of the Cable Car Museum and the SM, SFMTA and uh, worked with them uh, to get access to all their, their, um, their um, archives and, uh, and then started talking to um, historians uh, and in the film, if you watched it, you'll see that we have a pretty good uh, group of uh, historians talk about the, the history of the cable cars. And um, so that's, that's pretty much how it, how it happened. I mean, it was like, okay, this needs to happen. And, and going back and saying why it kind of bit me in the rear is I, we'd had, go, we'd had pretty good promotion whenever we did a, a San Francisco history documentary in the city with uh, regarding to um, the press. They'd be like, oh, great, you're doing one on, you know, the Cliff House. Let's, you know, I'll run a story on it, da, da, da. And then we're like, okay, great. You know, that's, that the, we live by getting out there. You know, that's how we live and die. And so I'm like, oh, with well, the cable cars, this is, I'm going to, I'm going to finally get some leather on the ball. You know, I'm going to finally get one that's going to, you know, go past first base and not get picked off. And uh, nobody, not one 
response. Nobody, I got no responses to any of our connections. And some of the, the people that I've gotten to, into a relationship with since I dealt with them in the past, I, I'm like, I finally just email in person. I go, hey, look, you know what? I'm trying really hard to, to promote this and nobody is responding. And, and the response is basically, oh, it's been done to death. There's so many documentaries on the cable cars and there's so much information on the cable cars. Nobody, nobody is going to care about that. It's been done to death. There's a story every month or every, sometimes every week on the cable cars. I'm like, yeah, I know that, but there's never been a documentary that there's no comprehensive history on who created it, where it came from and all, all of that. There was nothing. And that's, and it really did. It, it kind of, uh, it kind of didn't get represented very well. Um, it, because of that, because basically all, all the media is like, ah, oh, it's been done. Nobody, you know, nobody cares. Uh, luckily, uh, the SSMTA and and most of the community in San Francisco caught on, and we we did pretty well with it. But it, that was it, to me, it was kind of like, wow, okay. And that's a, a lesson learned. It's like if you pick, if you find, if you stumble upon a, a subject that that you think is going to be amazing, and every reason you want to be clamoring for, like, oh my god, goodness, and that ain't going to happen. It's like you know. They, they just assume since it's, you know, everybody kind of thinks they know what the cable cars are about, that it's not important. That is really, uh, I think that's really telling. Um, I think there's probably a lot of subjects that would be like that in this area. I mean, I can say though, it might seem like it's a specialized subject. Like is somebody from New York or Kansas City gonna be fascinated about cable cars unless they come here on a vacation and go, wow, that's a really neat thing. So it really is kind of specialized to San Francisco. And yet, I guess we're soaking in it. I mean, you know, people just assume that I, that's, um, I think that's something that everybody here could think about how, how interesting that is with some, with some, some subject matter. Um, well, I mean, bouncing off of that, people from those other states should and, and could be really interested in it because they used to have cable cars. The entire country had cable cars. Uh -huh. In fact, Rice Aroni built their brand off of people saying, oh my goodness, I remember those little cable cars that we used to ride and they're only in San Francisco now. So let's go to San Francisco and ride the cable cars. And that's one of the reasons we still have them. The other is that this is where it started. This is the very first cable car line was created and built in San Francisco by Andrew Smith Halliday. And, and it's the only running ones in the, in the world. Well, there's a, a couple that are kind of considered cable cars, but I don't consider them cable cars that are running. But these are the longest running. I mean, this is the beginning and the end. And it's, that's people should be like, wow. But, you know, time goes on and there's not anybody who remembers riding in Chicago on the cable cars, you know? Sure, sure. I mean, well, I could say like a subject like Alcatraz. I'm going to guess that there's probably, you know, been 20 documentaries on Alcatraz. But has there been one that is similar to what the style of yours, which is the in-depth, the mechanics the talking about all the different aspects of it, or is it just talking about a story of this or a story or a part of the legacy, a part of, of what right. happened there. And you, that's the part that I, I really am hoping that everybody has had a chance to see the documentary. If you haven't, it's available on Vimeo at a discounted price uh, uh, for now. So you check it while you can, um, or you can buy the documentary rather inexpensively, uh, which is great for your shelf. Um, but it, it just gives you, it's so rich of information. I mean, it's detailed. If people want, you know, they want the details, boy, they're going to get the details. So, um, so what steps did you take in order to make the documentary happen? Well, I mean, at first uh, was just get as many books as I can and start reading uh, and also find whatever little video and, and stuff that I did find um, uh, the documentaries and stuff like that and watch those and see what people were focused in on that. And then reaching out to, like I said, the uh, the, the uh, cable car museum and also SFMTA. And the funniest the, the funniest thing about it is um, a, a dear friend Jose who works uh, at the um, cable car museum. Um, he's he's a, a great character, and he he is was my doorway to get to the SFMTA and everybody else. I would call the city and talk to the city people, and they're like, "Oh no no, you can't have any access at all." And then finally, they're like, "Well, if Jose says." <laughs> you can have access then you can have access and it was really funny because it's like i'm like this guy works at the you know he's he's the, basically kind of the owner of the, the museum and the and the um the gift shop but i mean he, he is not a, an employee of the city and he's not an employee of the SFMJ, but he was the gatekeeper and he's the one who got me in touch with pretty much all of the people that are in the documentary except for um uh the cable car um uh, operator 
which I originally had uh, a, a few lined up to uh, interview and, and uh, uh, our, our, the, the uh, person we interviewed is, uh, uh, was sa savvy enough to, to kind of sabotage it until he got himself and that's it as, as the uh, <laughs> He ends up being the most well-known one, yeah. you know. And they all just went, "All right, just let him talk." Okay, fine. No, no, no. He 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 maneuvered. It was pretty funny how he did it. And now I I love him. Yeah, but you can see that he is. There's a reason why he's well-known. It's because he knows what he's doing. So he start, likes it if if you see him on the you know operating the cable car. You're like, "Hey Val, hey Val!" Like he's like he said it happens all the time. Like um, <laughs> tourists and everything. I'm like, "Hey Val." So you do a close up on a and starring Val and there's a little glint on his teeth. Yeah. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I gotta say the SFMTA was, was great. They're, they opened up their they, their library to us and their photos and and uh and and actually it's in their their uh I can't remember the, the term is uh, what their their function is for the city. Um that they that's I, I I met their demands for what they to to uh uh, properly uh, advertise the the um, cable car, so uh, they didn't charge me anything for the the use of the photographs, which was amazing because normally, that's that's where I'm spending the most money is on you know use of pictures. Well, and that's the thing that obviously showed that you knew what you were doing. You were being respectful of the subject matter, um, and that it benefited them to benefit you with that. And I mean that that I would I would think they would just you know fall over themselves to help because who's doing a documentary on cable cars? But we both have had situations where you're like, you're making this very difficult. Why? Why are you doing that? And there are people just, I don't know if it's human nature or sometimes just the way things are. And I don't want to get into bureaucracy. Sometimes it's bureaucracy, but sometimes it's just personality. So um, I ran, I ran, ran, well, you run into that, like you just said and everything. And I did run into it with the cable cars. Uh, yeah. Some people that will not be named uh, held on to their material like it was, it, there was nothing like it. I mean, we're talking about really old material that gets <laughs> basically public domain, but they held on to it. And I was informed that I was stepping on toes because they were planning on doing a film on the cable cars, oh, which oh. still hasn't come out. So, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah the great, the great the undone. Yes, yes. The Mechanics Institute was great too. Their, their access, oh, and, and they were awesome. Yeah, and yeah, Taryn. Taryn in the documentary. Yeah, she's in the documentary and um, she's a tremendous resource, especially for information about Andrew Smith Halliday. She, she knows everything about him. And I, I it, you know, she brings the fascination of wire rope to life. I, <laughs> I have to say, now I, now I notice wire rope everywhere in the world. Like that's Andrew Smith Halliday, you know? <laughs> Well, why don't you tell us, do you have any good stories you want to share about the making of the films or any good stories about cable cars in general or anything you found out about from the in the history banks that you're like, oh my gosh, that's so interesting. People need to know that maybe wasn't included in the film. Um, you know, it, I, I try to include as much as I possibly could in the film, and it, but it is funny when you when you show the film in theaters and then you have a Q&A afterwards. The, what people come up with that, that I didn't include, you know, the, the, the mysteries that I, uh, there's apparently, uh, and I did know about it, there was a, the, the cable car nympho, a girl, a woman who was hit by a cable car and she became a nymphomaniac afterwards and she was known as a cable car nympho. <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, and the guys are like, how come you didn't include her in the documentary? I'm like, well, I, I mean, what part of the history is that? It's like, okay, so, all right, sure, next time, if I run into the, like the sailboat nympho in San Francisco, I'll Throw it right in the documentary. <laughs> the list of people who've been hit by vehicles and became nymphomaniacs. Yeah. You know. <laughs> well, gee, I wouldn't have thought about that. I got to say. No. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That doesn't really fit into the history banks or anything. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then, like, uh, um, uh, I, I got a couple of people saying, "How come you didn't use? You know, I left my heart in San Francisco. Uh, it's such a, you know, because the little cable cars <laughs> for the stars and all that stuff." And I'm like, "Well, because it probably would have cost me ten grand to just yeah. get the licensing, and sure. then it would have cost me." X amount of money every single time I, we played it or used it. So that that's another reason we, do, when we do our films, we have a, our own band called Hobgoblin and we create our own music. So I, I that's my workaround to not have to uh, license a bunch of stuff. And that, that actually can be, that can be the end of the, uh, the end of the budget right there. So. Well, it can be the end of the film that the Martin Luther King uh, documentary uh, has, is, doesn't play because of the music rights. They, they won't, they made a beautiful film about Martin Luther King, but they, they, it got played for like a few years and never played again. 
because the film the the music rights are are in contest. So it just it, it kills films. Mm -hmm. My gosh. Mm -hmm. Um, anything else about, about the making of the film that, um, cause I want to do, I, well, before I do that, if there's anybody who has any questions that they'd like to ask, we do have the Q and the A and the, and the chat. Um, it's pretty low key, uh, uh, focus, uh, today. Um, so if you have any, uh, any questions you'd like to ask directly, um, please do, um, through chat or Q and A. Um, but continue with the stories because I think that kind of stuff's really it's it's fun yeah, I, I get the funniest thing is like uh I uh I I had connections with uh um coffee tv uh, and my uh, a couple of cameramen and people that I work with on a regular basis uh uh with with those uh, people and and um we uh one of the cameramen uh, Chris Bellini and I bought all day passes one day for for the cable cars <laughs> and we had our camera equipment we were going to go around and, and one thing um I didn't do much gorilla camera work on this i actually got permission from the city and stuff like that and one of the big things is like if you want to ride the cable car and film in the cable car you have to rent the cable car for the day oh, and wow. you have to rent the two operators and you have to rent two police officers Holy so God. it would have been oh. like a car i would have had to buy a car and hand it to the city to do it for a day so i never got on and and filmed inside you know i mean i used footage from other things but i never did it and if i in retrospect, if I had to do it over again, I would just jump on the cable car and do it because the cable car got drivers at the cable, the grip men and the, they're all hams. And the, and they're, it would just look like I was like, you know, a, 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 a tourist filming stuff, but I should have done it and I didn't. And that's one of the regrets I kind of have, but I, I mean, the film works without that. Um, but in retrospect, I wish I would have done that. Um, but uh, we bought the all day pass, Chris Blaney and I bought the all day passes. And that was one of the things we we're going to kind of do. And uh, we got to ride the cable car, one cable car, and the rest of the day, we were walking around trying to catch them, and they're just packed. There, we on any of them, so we just we we literally walked around shooting all the locations and never getting back on. Like when we first got on the morning, we we're like getting ourselves set up to to shoot inside the cable cars and do all that stuff, and we couldn't because we could never get back on a cable car all day long. So we bought two passes for no good reason. Did you, and did it was, you do this in the middle of like the summer or something? Yeah, it was summer. Yeah. Oh, it, yeah, it was super fun, both for um, once I met up with those guys at the end of that day. And then when we went around with Ben Aronoff, our photographer, you know, I have a ball being like the driver in between everything. So like, OK, quick, pull over here and we're going to film these things. And then, you know, we have this list of locations and things to film. And, you know, I just have a ball doing all that logistics stuff and, and being the support person behind the scenes. Like for me, that's my very favorite thing. And I was just realizing before this, usually Stefan does this on his own. It's never the two of us. I'm usually doing the merch table. So, you know, this is kind of a, a first. Thanks, Rena, for uh, uh, sure. having us both as a <laughs> fair guest today. There's well, no merchandise table when we have a Zoom. But people <laughs> but do go and have a website. <laughs> but do go to novemberfire.com and buy yeah. up all their stuff. Uh, because they do have merch to buy uh, to sell. Uh, yes. Well, no, the thing is, that's the thing is, I have no doubt. I know that you two work very well as a team and have, and and I, I've heard nothing but wonderful things from both of you about each other and how you support each. And so, and I know because when I was helping with a film, I was doing craft services until I wised up and hired some kid to do it instead. So, because uh, you know, at some point it gets really boring cutting open the muffins one too many times. But, um, <laughs> but mean, it's essential to filmmaking yeah. to make sure your people are fed and watered and, yes, yes, and sure. or booze, depending on the scene. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, so um, let's see, I had a list of things here. One, so, uh, but, but, but writing, oh, you had uh, people's tales of cable cars, riding to school, uh, skating uphill. Did you have anything that you wanted to share about that? I mean, we just when we showed the, the documentary across San Francisco um, at the at different theaters, um, we would have people like telling us the stories about what they did, you know, and, and uh, coming home from school and jumping on the cable cars and jumping off of them, like running and while well, it's uh, moving and jumping on. Because back in, you know, the 60s and 70s, they probably really didn't care too much about kids doing that kind of thing. And then, uh, yeah, uh, historically, none of the people we ran into uh said this but i guess kids used to make wire hooks and hook the cable 
and ride their skates with the, oh the power of the cable because the cable's always always moving. Oh my so god! <laughs> I, I guess they they frowned upon that because that was a little bit too much with kids running, you know, flying around on their uh, eight mile an hour skates. I, I really want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I'm, I'm like that sounds amazing. <laughs> we were we were at the Balboa showing it, and we're in the lobby with. Our, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I just I, we we were in, we're in the lobby showing it, and uh, uh uh we showed it, and we're in the lobby selling our, our stuff, and. And a, a a guy a guy came out of the theater. And he's all, "Wow, that's that's amazing! I, you know, that's that's really a, a great film, and I really enjoyed it." And he's all, "If there was, I would just wish there was, we had a, a a time machine to go back and and ride those." And I just kind of looked at him and go, "Yeah, you can just go over to California, pal. They're still there. <laughs> it's the time machine. It's the same vehicle <laughs> in the same system. Uh, Get on it. I'm Get just trying it. to do it." I'm just trying to picture the coat hanger and right. I mean, wouldn't there be a possibility of something getting sucked in or electrical something or it just, oh my gosh. Yeah, Not there, electrical. There's no electrical power it's all at all. Mechanical. It's, yeah, it's all mechanical. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't have any electrical problems, but yeah, getting something going wrong could, could really happen. Yeah. And I'm I sure it is. I'm, I'm, I'm worried about like, you know, the, the fork in the outlet kind of a, you know, not that you don't even know that something like that could happen, but okay. All right. It's just mechanical stuff that can crush. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There yeah. is no third rail on the cable car. Simply, <laughs> simply crushing. Yeah. That's the cool thing, actually. I mean, I think that a lot of the mechanical stuff is the most fascinating thing. As you know, I love race cars and everything. So I'm super fascinated with all the mechanical aspects. And the coolest thing is the powerhouse, the cable car, where the cable car museum is is the one source of power for the entire system. And you could load it up with far more cable cars than there are, and it wouldn't matter. It's such a strong system. It's wow. that, that fascinates me. And so it is a purely, you know, it is electrical now, it used to be coal, um, but um, the, the only source of power is from the, the powerhouse and the, the cables come and go from there. And, and for green energy, it's it's probably, there can't be anything better or more energy efficient than how the cable cars work. So from a climate control still, are you saying that in the old days they were shoveling coal? There was somebody who literally was, or Well, there was, there was a lot of powerhouses around San Francisco. So yeah, there was people shoveling coal. Oh and most of them had giant smokestacks. So that's, you, you could see a cable car station, you know, a, 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 a powerhouse far away in the city because that would have this the smokestacks yeah and you can see um like before the 1906 earthquake these massive massive super tall smokestacks but then um you know they were basically obliterated and brought to a third of their height um in the earthquake these giant smokestacks yeah there's still one at the cable car uh, uh the powerhouse now they still have one of them symbolically there it's cut off i mean but they they, they left it there so you get an idea what it was I'm just picturing that scene in Titanic, not my favorite film, but uh, that scene where the guys are down in the hole and they're, you know, shoveling the coal just to keep things going and all that. I'm just picturing that for San Francisco Cable because I don't, I never, that wasn't something I would have put in my mind. Uh, and now I can't stop thinking about it. My goodness. Right. Because uh, how else would they have the power back then? You know, they don't, they didn't have electricity at first and then, then they did. And then they had uh, the, the, um, railways after that, the electrically powered municipal railways after that. She was. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm constantly mind, mind boggled. Um, so <laughs> is there any other thing you were talking about, uh, global warming and, and effects on the system? Is there any you mentioned yeah. that before? You, uh, um, uh, it was funny too, because we did a, um, a talk, a, um, uh, what was it? It's like you drink the science, the thing where you drink and we talked at the, I can't remember what it was called. Yeah, we did a thing where everybody was drinking and we showed a, a slideshow and talked about the film. Oh, Nerd Night. Nerd Night, we did Nerd Night uh, in San Francisco. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I said, I started talking about the effects of global warming and I actually got people like, Boo, like, hey, what are you talking about global? Like it doesn't exist. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, global warming doesn't exist. And these are like young, smart people. And I'm like, really? Anyways, uh, what happens is the, the um, the mechanism, the grip that goes and grabs the cable has to has to go through the slot, which has or two pieces of metal. 
um, if it gets to San Francisco has a good climate and it doesn't vary too much, but on really, really, really hot days, you will see water patches on some parts of the track. And that's because the SFMTA has to go around and wet those down to cool them. Because if they get too hot, they, the steel expands and the grip actually starts to hit the steel. So there's going to be a matter of time when the temperatures go hot enough that, that it's not going to, it's not going to function anymore. Um, I, I'm sure now with modern materials, they can probably reduce the size of the grip and maybe even figure out a way to open the channel a little bit deeper, but you can't open it too far because of, you know, people getting caught in the, in the cable line. But yeah, with the, with the temperatures going up, the metal doesn't work as well because uh, it expands and it, and it can actually function, it can damage and hurt the, the use of the cable car. So yeah, global warming does have an effect. Wow. Again, not something I think people would have thought about how that would make a, a make a difference, even if we go up a few degrees, that it could make that much of a difference. But yeah, you know, another um, just another thing I just thought of with um, the lines for cable cars and all that stuff, um, they everybody um, wants uh, people need to know in general that if you have a, your local and you have a clipper card, you can ride the cable cars and you shouldn't wait in the line with the tourists. You should go to the next block up and grab the cable car there. Yeah, yeah, the, the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the in the know information is they don't load, like all those big lines at the turn turnstiles, uh, not turnstiles, but the, the turnarounds, they don't load the car up completely. There's still seats, they, they have to leave seats. So if you actually just walk to the next stop down, there'll be seats. So the, the in the know people, I, and I got chastised by some of the group, I'm going, you're making a film and you don't know the ins and outs of how to get on the cable car? <laughs> like we're trying to get the whole line here. <laughs> but um, it was also awesome after the, um, after when we show these movies, people come up to us and have all these great stories. And, um, and I guess it's because I'm a woman out there. Um, all these women would tell me about how, you know, back in, the day, you know, decades ago, you used to have to wear a skirt or a dress to wear the cable cars and a woman did protest by wearing pants and eventually she, it, pants were allowed by women on the cable cars. So it was definitely one of those moments of, um, you know, trying to become gender equal out there in the public world that women should be able to wear pants. And then a lot of really, really older women were talking about, um, when they used to ride the cable cars to school and they'd have their dresses and skirts on, but they're uh, more slippery than pants, I guess. So they would, their favorite thing to do was to sit at one end of those nice um, varnished benches and then it would go up the hill and they'd thump, down to the other side of the bench and hit the side. So it was kind of like a little on the way to and from school roller coaster ride for them, which just sounded like so much fun, especially because it's empty at that point. So are you saying that you had to wear a dress or skirt in order to get a ride on the cable yeah. car? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've heard about restaurants that have a certain dress code, but cable mm -hmm. cars, oh my gosh. Yeah. I think it was um, the early, I, I might be wrong on this, but I think it was the early seventies that you could start wearing pants on the cable cars. Wow. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's just mind boggling. All right. So I just want to make sure. So it looks, I, I have a feeling that the kinds of things we're talking about here aren't really adding extra questions. I have a feeling people have stories they can tell about riding the cable car, what have you. But in order to keep us on time and, and not to uh, belabor things, I just want to make sure you have, you have any more stories that you'd like to share about making the documentary or any other random things about about cable cars in general that you might think would be good for us to know before we start talking about other projects that you work on? I, I mean, if the film, I pretty much try to cover as much as I could. Um, so I, I don't, I mean, you could go on and on, on you know, just talking about the cable cars. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't really offhand have any anything else that's, that's blinking in my brain right now. Well, and I just want to say, in general, it was it's amazing. We have these great, as Strefan was mentioning, our our camera crew and all the guests that we had on the movie, and then our voiceover people and animators, and everybody is. It's just amazing that we have all these great professional people to work with that we can, and our musicians, um, photographers, just 
this great group of people who come and help us consistently and everybody's so professional and you know if we need something in a certain time frame it gets done and it's just amazing because you know this isn't these aren't projects that sit on the shelf you know for a decade or two and never get done you know everybody ends up making it happen and that's amazing and very cool and apparently pretty rare in the world <laughs> I, I can I can attest to that. Uh, well, I, what I want to say is to everybody: if you haven't seen this documentary, you just need to see the documentary. If you go to our website and our April webpage, uh, you have a, There's a link there that can take you to the the film itself. Um, there's also a link to November Fire where you can purchase the DVD, and also they've got all kinds of amazing T-shirts and stickers and patches and all kinds of things that have to do with everything from horror to uh, some silent film stuff in there to some of the documentaries that you've made, um, the Playland of the Beach and the Sutra Baths and the Cliff House and all those things that you're involved with, I think are just absolutely wonderful. And we've shown those in our theater and we'll show them again when we are open again at some point. Um, so with that, um, what other things, what other projects uh, I mean, I just mentioned some of the projects you've worked on. What are other projects that you've worked on that you've been really uh, proud of? Um, I, I think my proudest one so far has been um, uh, a film called Jack Pierce, um, The Maker of Monsters. Jack Pierce was a, a universal makeup artist for decades and he did every iconic monster that uh, was created for by Universal. Uh, I mean, he helped with Dracula even though uh, Bela Lugosi did his own makeup. Um, but then uh, Frankenstein, uh, the, the Wolfman, the Mummy. Uh, he didn't do the Creature of the Black Lagoon. He had gone. He had been. He had left the, the um, Universal at that point. But I think that's my favorite and my the thing I poured my most attention and time and energy into. And it was it was a really long, long process of just. It was years and years and years of gathering material for it, um, and uh, photographs and uh, whatever material I could get. Uh, so I think that's probably, and then Cable Cars is my second, but for sure, I think uh, Jack Pierce is my, my favorite so far. I thought that was a great film. We've shown that a few times at Halloween and uh, it's, it, people really, really dug it. I, I think the whole uh, movie makeup, um, especially when things were black and white, it's just, um, it, it, it's hard, it was harder, you know, and no CGI and we're just putting stuff, you know, prosthetics and different things on people to make them look a certain way. I, I I think it was really well done. So I, I can. Well, I'm, thank you. I mean, like the first, I mean, I got footage from the monkey talks in it. And that's, that's what put Pierce, Jack Pierce on the map. I mean, cause it, it the, in the reviews of it, they're like, how did they get the monkey to actually, you know, act the way it did. It's like they, you know, they say they, it was good enough for people to say, you know, as a, a trained monkey. And it also puts like the Planet of the Ape uh, makeup to shame. Uh, it's, it's so, it's so good. But uh, yeah, he did. Cause he, he wasn't just the horror makeup artist. He was Universal's head makeup. So he mostly did glamor makeup. So if you're watching a Universal film that's in black and white, chances are you're looking at Pierce's work. So, I mean, he, he did so much stuff besides horror and the majority of the horror. And then also his history in sports is amazing as well. I mean, he basically was the manager or I mean, yeah, the manager uh, of the first basketball team to win in the Olympics. And, and, you know, there's stuff in there that are like, wow, I, I didn't know that when I was doing this, you know, when I first started working on it, I was like, oh, this horror guy, I really like him. And then the more research you do and the more you learn, that's like, wow, you, you, you keep on turn, you know, turning over rocks and finding more grubs of, of information. <laughs> and that's the coolest thing that documentary ended up, um, that was about 10 years of research and um, Streffen was making all these other movies in the meantime while he's collecting photographs and information about Jack Pierce and, you know, going through um, just scanning those little thumbnail photos for more and trying to find as many pictures of Jack Pierce as he could and piece together the tale of, of him and, you know, all the relationships that we built with the people who provided the photographs and, and all this stuff is, um, it's just so cool to, you know, whenever, he's researching for a documentary and collecting books and collecting photographs and meeting people and starting to interview people and everything just always builds and builds and builds until you can finally, you know, make it, make a documentary. And um, I, I just, I really love the way he 
is able to put that stuff together to to tell a cohesive story because it really is um you know we end up with a a sizable library of of books and and stuff um and then uh being able to translate that into the, these tales that anybody can follow and that's the other thing too about the um you know you're mentioning all the technical details of the cable car documentary is it's technical details but it's not um so above anybody's heads you know it's easily accessible technical information so if you wanted to learn more you could but you also walk away understanding how it works how it works exactly mm -hmm. so and I, I yeah and what you're outlining for the Jack Pierce documentary is what you did also with the cable car documentary as far as you know the you, you start out and then the thought is okay well what's the story what's what are we trying to you know not just a chronology not just a okay this because things do build upon themselves yeah. and then all of a sudden it's like aha here it is i know exactly what we need to do in order to tell the story and yes i live with a historian it's i'm kind of seeing that same thing happen where just you know the smoke starts coming out of the ears like, okay we got it we've got the story um but i also find myself saying to him that's good stuff that's that's right. we need to share that with people and i appreciate that about you uh both of you because you um you figured out a way to share it with people not everybody knows how to do what you do so what else is in the works because you were telling me about a project that i'm totally all over now and this is one of those things where people might say haven't there been <laughs> programs about this but i get i'm guessing that you have a different way of uh of telling about it so go ahead okay so by doing the different documentaries on san francisco history um, and I still want to do waterways and lighthouses in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I'm going to get to that one day. But uh, you, it's kind of like peeling an onion. You keep getting more and more information. And, and the cable cars really opened up a lot of uh, um, deeper information on San Francisco than I didn't. Because while you're researching something like the cable cars, you run across all kinds of other stuff. And uh, you're reading, you're like, who the heck is this guy? And why was he there? And what was he doing in San Francisco at that time? And, uh, and then you're like, oh, oh, I see now this and that and the other thing. But I mean, if you get down to the, 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 the brass tacks of San Francisco as a city and the reason the city is the way it is and the reason the city is so unique in the way it is, is because of the Barbary Coast. And that was the beginning of the San Francisco was the Barbary Coast. I mean, it, it was, um, you know, um, when gold got discovered, it became a totally different ball game. Uh, and especially how quickly people could get to that our point in the world but so the barbary coast in san francisco uh is what i'm going to be working on well i have been working on for a while and uh um and yeah there it's it's funny because I, I i read i read a thing just yet yesterday online about uh people talking about the vigilance committee who, who there was two different vigilance committees during the during that timeline and uh it's just they have it so wrong i'm like i'm like you got it it's it's so you got it so completely wrong but it's historically been told to us in such a format, in such a way that we, that that's people just assume. A uh, Bancroft did most of the research on the Barbary Coast and he was very uh, one-sided and his one-sided was a, a love for the history of it, um, but he kind of neglected really the politics of it. And um, uh, there's been a couple of books that have come out in the past 10 years that really put a, pretty good spotlight on the politics and what really was going on uh, and what created the Barbary Coast and why we had a, a basically a den of, you know, sin in the middle of the San Francisco, you know, right by the coast. And uh, also why the vigilant committee, the true reason why the vigilant committees popped up. Um, so, yeah, I think that I, I've, I'm, I'm pretty much close to finishing my basic research, but just like anything, you, you find something else. And like right now I'm reading the, the the destination of the Indians in California, and um, uh, that that had a huge influence on on what happened to the Barbary Coast as well. So there's always more to learn, but I do have a pretty good grasp on what and why it happened. Obviously, the gold rush, but the politics of it are, are what built it. And um, uh, so I think I'll I think I'll, I think I got a good a pretty good idea of of it, and I think that it's going to be pretty interesting to people because it's going to light. You're going to be like what? no way that no way 
<laughs> and uh, uh, so, yeah, because like I said, Bancroft did most of the work on it. And most people think one linear thought of how the Barbary Coast happened and why the things went down in terms of the way they did. And the truth is that it's, that there's, it's, it's much deeper and there's much more information and there's reasons. There are good and, and uh, they're not good reasons, but there are uh, uh, powerful reasons why things went down the way they did and why the city is the way it is. But I mean, all in all, San Francisco, I mean, the, the gold rush brought, you know, tens of thousands of men in one location for years mining. And then there's one uh, main city, which was San Francisco, where you could frolic. And so our, our, our history and the way our city is built and the way our culture in San Francisco is, 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 is straight from the Barbary Coast and it still is. So what were, what's the years of, the, of, of that time period? Well, I mean, obviously, the the gold rush of '49 is is when when uh, you started to get the real the real um, meat of the Barbary Coast happening. But previous to the discovery of gold, the key players were already in San Francisco. The key players that that created most of the media, um, most of the uh, um, buildings, most of the uh, government functioning were were here before that happened. So then, I mean, the Barbary Coast didn't really get closed down until, you know, the 1970s. Um, so you have a long history of, of different, uh, different uh, the, it, it, the Barbary Coast evolving into different things and you still have it. There's still parts of the San Francisco that are still there that are, that are from the Barbary Coast. I mean, there's still a few buildings. Sherman's building is still there. Um, uh, there's, we still have, uh, uh, Broadway, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a lot more cleaned up now than it was, but Broadway is a direct uh, lineage to, to from the uh, original Barbary Coast because they kept moving streets because they the city kept closing down different parts of it, uh, but they would they would just you know just move. So it, it, it's it's an interesting uh, it's been an interesting journey and, and like I said I'm still somewhat reading on it, but I think I got a pretty good grasp and I got a, I, I think it's a good story, but let's see it get ignored as well. <laughs> but and also that's the funny thing is since it went on for over a century you know always at the back of our minds is how do you turn that you know how do you tell that story in a non five hour documentary right. <laughs> you know how how do you tell that you know, give it the the information and and attention it deserves <clears throat> but um have it be comprehensive but you know whatever length of time you know people will sit in a theater for sure well i will not be asking you when should we expect to see it uh i'm just not because i think that's not fair <laughs> it'll get done when it gets done you know that's just, that's where that's where i'm saying i'm saying i'm, I'm okay, okay i think everybody understands why we're saying that right now um yes. so we'll hope for the best to see it in the future and I thank you both for being part of this and everybody go watch that documentary because it's awesome. Thank you very much for uh, being part of our weekend. Cool. Thanks, thanks, Rena. Thanks, Rena. Um, we're looking forward to getting back to Niles in person whenever we can and uh, we'll keep Zooming in the meantime. Thanks for, you know, thanks to you and Frederick and David and the whole crew over there at Niles because you guys are super dedicated and we love you. Aww. Well, it goes both ways. All right, guys. Take care. I'm going <laughs> to end you. this now. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.